All right, welcome everyone to our webinar. This is the CARES Act Everything You Need to Know webinar. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Liz. I am the marketing manager here at ASCOMP Technologies, and I am joined by Joel Friend, accountant and financial advisor with Joel Friend and Associates. So welcome, Joel. Thank you very, very much, Liz. Just to give you a brief history, um, one of our business leaders here at ASCOM was recently on a webinar where he heard Joel speak and he connected with him and thought this would be a great opportunity for Joel to speak to our network regarding the CARES Act and really giving a clear picture of what this means for you and your business. Um, Joel is going to be providing us with a lot of information today, um, so just a few key points here. Uh, which loans can provide the largest immediate assistance? Clear view of what the loans cover. Who can and should apply? Stipulations regarding loan forgiveness and how to apply. Um, you know, I do want to spend a few seconds just letting you know that ASCOMP is really trying to do what we can for the community here. Um, we are spending a lot of time talking about and thinking about on a regular basis ways we can help you get the information you need regarding updates on COVID-19, telehealth options, whether that's communication with your patients and your clients, transitioning to working from home, and much more. Um, if there is any other information we can get for you, please make sure you let us know we can partner with subject matter experts like Joel and bring that webinar right to you. So right now, our intent is serving and doing anything we can for each of you. You know, we might be practicing social distancing in a literal sense, um, but we're trying to practice virtual closeness right now. And we have the technology to do it. We have the ability to do it. So we're on board. Uh, a few housekeeping items before I turn things over to Joel. Um, during this webinar, we will have you set on mute. So if you do have any questions, please be sure to use the chat feature so we can communicate your questions at the end of the webinar. There's gonna be a few uh, moderators that are in that chat um, fielding those questions to Joel. So feel free to ask um, as you go along. If you think of something, uh, we can get that question right to him. Um, we do just also wanna remind you that this webinar is being recorded. So we will email you access to this recording at the conclusion. So I won't take any more of your time. So without further ado, please welcome Joel Friend. Thank you very, very much, Liz. I sincerely appreciate it. So what we're gonna be focusing on today is the Paycheck Protection Program and complementary to that, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL. What I wanna focus on primarily is the PPP. And then of course, answer and assist any questions that we may have associated with this product from the SBA 7A program. Probably the most important thing, just to give you a little background on myself and why I was brought for you, as Liz mentioned, used to work for KPMG Pete Marwick, which is one of the big four international tax and accounting practices. I also concurrently taught with and as a graduate professor of finance and accounting students at the local universities here in South Florida. We currently own a practice of 10 individuals and the wealth of knowledge and the human capital that I believe that we bring to the table is of great magnitude. What I wanna do now is I want to be able to share a screen with everybody that will talk about what, is, what does the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, what is it all about? How do we actually calculate the dollar amount of the PPP? How do we apply for the PPP? And how is it calculated and how do we go through getting this loan and having the ability of having this loan completely forgiven? I find the best way of being able to, to do such is to go through an analysis, a spreadsheet that will talk about what variables go into the PPP. When you apply online with your financial institution, your bank, there's gonna be different requirements necessary for each different financial institution. Some financial institutions are requiring a huge amount of information and others from what I've experienced since Friday, you know, April 3rd, they're requiring much less information. 
all of them are going to ask for what are the salaries that you have? What were the salaries in dollar amounts that you paid to yourself as an employee and to all of your other employees during, in some cases, just the tax year of 2019? And some financial institutions are not using 19 numbers, but rather are using a 12 year rolling total. In this example, let's make the assumption that we had 500 and let's just call it $540,000 worth of payroll in the year of 2019. We know that the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare is going to be 7.65% of that. Food hey, and it doesn't look like I can see your screen. I'm sorry. You cannot see my screen. Let me try that again. I apologize. Okay, now we can. Thank you. All right. Apologize about that. So this is the form. I'm not sure exactly where it went, went wrong, but this is every bank or financial institution is going to ask for the wages, the salaries as presented on your either your W-3 you're going to also have to supply 941s, 940s to be able to substantiate the dollar amount of the wages that were enumerated to both yourself as the employee. Distributions, dividends do not count. As well as what were the total employer share of Social Security and Medicare tax on those gross wages. FUDA and SUDA is the federal unemployment tax or state unemployment tax. Typically, those are de minimis amounts. So let's just say the, the company paid a total of 1500 during the course of that taxable year. Did the company pay on behalf of its employees any portion of their health insurance through a company-sponsored health insurance plan? Let's make the assumption in this case that the company did in fact do such and that dollar amount was 25,000. Did the company also have any type of retirement plan for the benefit of its employee base? If they did, what was the employer's share of those contributions made on behalf of each and every employee? And let's say this company did and the total was approximately 8,900 per year. What we'll see here is the total payroll cost for 2019 sums to $616,710. What that means is the maximum loan that the government, the SBA will extend to you through your financial institution is 2.5 times the payroll average. In this case, the amount sums to $128,481.25. So this under the PPP, Payroll Protection Program, will be the maximum loan based upon this set of facts and circumstances. Again, from what I have learned since Friday when this program first opened up, and this is still a very, very fluid concept and topic, is that certain financial institutions are looking for a 12 month look back, meaning they're gonna go from April of 2019 and want your payroll summary journals for each and every month through March 30th, 31st, 2020. So this is a fluid situation some financial institutions are just looking for what did you pay those individuals? How much did you pay your employee base in 2019? So provided that you submit your application through your financial institution, the maximum loan amount based upon this criterion is $128,481. Let's make the assumption that we are going to pay our employees or we pay our employees every two weeks. If that is the case, 
our total amount that we're paying our employees on a bi-weekly basis is going to sum to $23,719.62. And this would be the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare. So during that time period, during the eight weeks after we receive this sum of money, we are then have to utilize these funds, these resources to of course keep our employee base in check, intact, which is why it's called the Pay Check Protection Program. We are looking and the government is looking to protect the paychecks for all of your employees. Hey, Joel, we, we did have a quick question in here, if I can interject. Um, um, it was asked if we can add subcontractor amounts to that, the amounts paid in 2019. You know, certain financial institutions are saying yes, and other financial institutions are saying no. From our reading of the documents, and my opinion is that the answer is yes, we should be able to add subcontractors to this overall equation. So the answer is yes. On a more conservative basis, I do not have it in, input it into this spreadsheet, but the answer is yes. If you are paying a subcontractor to do work, okay, from let's say the gig economy, and that individual is truly a subcontractor that is performing services that you pay and will have those type of engagements on a regular basis, then the answer is yes, they should be included. Okay, thanks for that clarification. And that would add to the overall total. Okay, and some financial institutions are asking for that information, others are not. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Unfortunately, there's going to be questions that I'm sure we're gonna have that on a case by case basis, this is not, and I, I, I stress this, this is not a one size fits all type of approach. There's going to be nuances and subtleties that your professional advisors, whether it be your CPA, your legal advisor, or the financial institution, your bankers that you're going through, that is going to vary how this formula is going to work. Okay, and then one follow up question to that um, was what about sole proprietors that have no payroll um, that are simply compensated from incoming jobs and contracts that vary Typically. from, you know, how is that handled for a sole proprietor? Again, we, we, there's two different types of loan products, which we'll talk about. And unfortunately, as of Friday, okay, this is how dynamic this is. There used to be, well, there is still two products, the economic injury disaster loan and the PPP. Prior to Friday, or even on Friday, because this didn't come out until this morning, it was that you could apply to both loans and achieve both loans. Okay, as of today, that has changed. You can either apply for one or the other. Okay. So it may be that the sole proprietor that we're speaking of that addressed that question, depending on his or her set of circumstances, one loan product over the other could potentially be of more benefit to them. Okay. But the, great. Answer, but the answer is yes, that individual could use the Paycheck Protection Program, submit documentations, their Schedule C, and be able to justify and show that their income stream now has, has been eroded and therefore qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program. Wonderful, okay. thank you. You're very welcome. So this in this fact situation is the total dollar amount that we should receive as the company, as the employer. If we use, okay, and if this sum from our payroll on a weekly basis stays the same. It's been consistent. We have not reduced our employee base. We have kept our employees in check. And this number in this case is
a second. So now we have a situation where 79% of the money that we are receiving is going towards payroll to keep our employee base, our human capital preserved. If that's the case, that's a very important ingredient. Why? We have the ability to use that 128,000 and we can get that amount completely forgiven provided that one, we keep the same amount of full-time equivalent employees during a certain time continuum and we do not reduce those employees' salaries by more than 25%. If we fail to do either or, then we have a pro rata reduction of the amount of forgiveness that the company will receive of this loan. In this case, we are over the 75%, meaning the rest of the expenses that this company will have in the following categories, and these are the categories that have been allocated, that have been prescribed to give forgiveness, to keep the lights on, so to speak. If we can consume the rest of this $26,000, okay, which is the total amount of the utilization of the Paycheck Protection Program in these categories over the eight week period from when we receive the monies, the entire amount here will be forgiven. So we know, and let's say we have a rent of 5,400 a month times that by two. Our company sponsored payroll, we know is 25,000. Over the year of 2019, we're going to make the assumption that it stayed exactly the same because it's eight weeks. We have two months of company sponsored health insurance that we would have as well. We would take an average of your electric bill. In this case, we're in Florida for this client, but this would be power and light, any type of electricity. Let's make the assumption it's about $500 a month. Our water bill, let's say it sums out to be on a two month period, 540. Telecommunications, any type of connectivity, internet, um, data services, long distance, basic service as far as telecommunications within the office. And let's make the assumption that every, on a two month period, it's about 2100 alarm monitoring for two months, 250. And if we have any loans, the interest on those loans for the business that was, that was taken out on or before, these loans that were taken out on or before February 15th of 2020, any loan taken out prior to that date, the interest on that loan would also be something that we would not have to and would be counted as far as an expense that would be forgiven of this amount. So in this scenario, and we also have a 401k here as well, because we were paying and we're doing this every 342.31. So if these were the expenses that this organization incurred over the eight weeks from the date that we received the maximum loan amount, this organization would have underutilized its paycheck protection program in the amount of five $5,548.67. What that means, and again, the laws have changed very, very fluid. 
you would owe that money back to the SBA, to the government at a rate of 1% per annum to be paid over two years. Or we could pay it all back if we want to immediately. There's no prepayment penalty. But at 1%, why would you give any of that money back? It is a very, very comfortable loan. So to the extent that we do not utilize these proceeds in the following manner by making sure that at least 75% or greater goes to payroll, and then we can consume it by the expenses that we are occurring over, let's say, the next eight weeks or two-month duration, if we do not consume all of it, the excess will convert to a loan payable over two years at 1% interest. This, in essence, is the program called the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. At this point, I think, you know, I would like to be able to address questions, concerns um, that pertain to this or the mechanisms that are necessary as to how we apply. Okay, great. Um, I don't think we have any questions that have come in as of yet that we haven't maybe already addressed. I think there was one additional question about if they've already applied for the economic injury program, but they would rather apply for the PPP, is there anything they can do in that regard? You know, that's a, that's a very, very interesting point. And from the reading of the material today, the answer is no. If we already made an application for one, it's going to preclude us from doing the others, depending upon when that application was made. Okay. So that's going to be very specific to that individual. Going forward, the answer is an emphatic no, one or the other. Okay. Depending upon when that loan was processed, when it was received, there could be things that can be done, possibly. But just contact the um, whoever. I would contact the SBA to see if one, we can withdraw that to see one, the guidelines. And there's new guidelines coming out as far as the time period of when you could have made application for one and theoretically double dipped. Right now, there's no more double dipping. Okay, thank you. Um, another question was, what if some employees are laid off right now? Okay, so as I mentioned before, this whole thing is to make sure that we keep the employee base in check, that we ensure that we the company is acting kind of as an extension of the unemployment compensation office, so to speak. We're trying to take the burden from government onto upon our own hands and to keep our human capital intact. If there are employees that have been laid off on a pro rata basis, so let's say you had 10 full-time equivalent employees in 2019, between February 15th and June 30th of 19. And from February 15th to June 30th of 2020, we reduced the amount of our full-time equivalent employees by half. That means only half of this dollar amount, the maximum loan, you'll still get the maximum loan, but only half of it would be subject to forgiveness. The other amount would be a loan at 1% payable over two years. Because part of the employers in this program's obligation is to ensure those paychecks to your employee base. Now, if you do have the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, that loan is going to be at 3.75%. You're supposed to have collateral if it's more than, but they're not going to refuse the loan if you do not, more than 25K and a personal guarantee if the loan is greater than 200,000. Under the PPP product that we're discussing here, no matter what the dollar amount up to 10 million, there is no 
personal guarantee and no collateral required at all. Okay, thank you. And isn't there some provisions also if you were to rehire employees that you would let go? Yeah, I mean, we do need to be, if we do need to rehire on or before June 30th, but you would also have a reduction in the actual total compensation to your employee base over that previously discussed time continuum. So therefore, while you meet the requirement of the full-time equivalent employees possibly, the reduction that you pay in salary during that time period would have been eroded. And to the extent that it was eroded by more than 25%, it would also come into play as far as a pro rata reduction of the amount of the loan you are going to be receiving and how much of that could be in the forgiveness category. Gotcha. So the sooner you get them back on payroll, the better, it sounds like. That's correct. All right, um, and then some. there were some questions. Yes, we are recording this, so we will make that available. It sounds like some people have had a, a little bit of internet issues. Um, so we will also be getting that out. And then, um, so we had another question that says, I saw that the SBA had its own application online. Do we have to apply only through a bank? What happens if we apply through the SBA? The Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is an SBA online application. You make that loan directly with the SBA. Okay. The Paycheck Protection Program, while yes, online, you could definitely find, even on my Facebook website and so forth, you'll be able to see what the form looks like. However, you have to go through your bank, your financial institution to be able to apply for that. And unfortunately, there's actually certain banks or financial institutions that are no longer even accepting this loan or applications for this loan. Okay. Um, all right. And then we had a question. What if the employer has also signed up for work share? Work share. Again, this is so it would not place undue nest resources upon the government. The government is saying, okay, instead of doing A, B, C, or D, why not go ahead? We will pay you employee, employer, and you in turn pay your employees. So from that vantage point, I don't know if that addresses the question exactly. Work share can mean many different things, um, but the whole intent of this is to ensure that your employees remain with you, that even if they are not and sitting idle at home, that they are not being productive, they are not being resourceful as far as to generate income for the organization, we are keeping them at bay. We are ensuring that they have stabilization. So if you are shifting that responsibility to another program, that would definitely eat into the amount that you would be able to receive of forgiveness. Okay, because of the loss in salary that you're spending. And Correct. All right, and then we had a, maybe a, a question for some advice here. Um, there, it's a sole proprietor with no debt and no employees. Um, so the question is what relief for expenses is there for my expenses and my lost income? Would the, PPP or the EIDL, which would be better for that? Well, again, that goes into what was the profitability? How much was earned in the previous year? What was the dollar amount that was subject to social security or other taxes, payroll taxes on their individual tax return? Just because you're a sole proprietor doesn't mean you don't have rent or utilities or you don't rent an office space, that you don't have telecommunications associated with your business. You do have all of that. The EIDL may provide more of a financial benefit than the Paycheck Protection Program. You really need to be able to juxtapose what's presented on the tax return versus the EIDL and what that will potentially provide. 
Okay, so thank you. Hard to make a definite distinction as far as which one would be better for that individual under those fact circumstances. I understand. Okay, great. Um, let's see. And we had another question that says they applied for the EIDL loan on 331 and have heard nothing. So how will I know not to double dip by applying for a PPP loan? They applied for it on what date? Uh, 331. 331. Yeah, March 31st. Have, have them go ahead and apply for the PPP. Okay. The, the cutoff date is that April 3rd. So even if you have not heard, go ahead and apply for the PPP loan. And I would do that as quickly as possible because some financial institutions are ceasing to accept applications um, for this loan. And you have to be an account holder. Your business has to have an account with that financial institution for you to make application for the PPP. So the sooner you can gather the necessary documentations and go to your financial institution, the better. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, it says, can I claim expenses from before the loan or only expenses after the loan is received? Only after the loan is received for eight weeks thereafter. Okay, so the eight so weeks starts once your loan is received. That is correct. Okay. Um, and then, and it looks like the question, another question is, is this, is a SEP IRA included here for the retirement? Would that, would that count for the retirement expenses? For the retirement, if you have a SEP, that implies that the company has a matching portion. So if the company matches a certain portion, for you as far as the business owner, if it's a corporate sponsored SEP, then the amount that you have to also contribute for each and every one of your employees would definitely count here as an employer retirement contribution on behalf of your employee base. So the answer is yes. If it's an individual SEP, then the answer is no. Okay. All right. Um... And then there's another question, is a 501c3 public nonprofit eligible? So is a nonprofit eligible? Yes, it is. And, and there's a lot of the nonprofits and so forth, even tribal organizations are permissible to get the Paycheck Protection Program. Wonderful. Um, and then there's also a question, is there a list available of institutions still accepting applications? I wish. <laughs> well, it sounds like before you said you need to already be um, you a have member to. of that institution. Correct. So if you're banking at Bank Y and Bank Y is no longer accepting PPP applications, then we have to really, that's a problem. So the truth of the matter is you have to be banking at that institution or we're gonna to need to pivot to another institution very, very quickly because only those institutions where you have a pre-existing banking relationship will allow you to apply. To apply for loan. Correct. Um, and just out of personal experience, I do know there's some, there's still some institutions that are still scrambling to get it in place too. So there may, there, Maybe there's still some coming in that regard. I have no idea. You know, it's this, this came live on Friday, right. April 3rd. And since Friday, April 3rd, and we have a, a fairly healthy tax and accounting practice. Among all my clients and even contemporaries, I have known no one as of yet to have received any of the funds. Okay. Um, okay, great. I mean, that's not great news, but <laughs> thank you for answering yeah, it's, that. <laughs> it's just being, you know, it's just, I have not seen that. I have not heard of that. I have not experienced that. I just heard a lot of frustrations as it results in making the application. But the sooner you make the application, the better. Okay. I know these financial institutions are doing anything and everything possible to make this work. Okay. Um, 
And then I think that might also already be kind of answering. There was a question about, are you aware of any banks that are more friendly in the process, less problematic to handle those loans? No. Okay. Um, even during today, going through and dealing with a multitude of financial institutions, each institution seemingly has, and they're asking different questions. I'm having clients, I'm telling clients, please, if you're banking at an institution that I may not be so familiar with, take a screenshot. Let me know the questions that they're asking so I am better prepared and poised to help individuals that also bank at that institution. Yeah. Because they're all kind of handling it a little bit differently, it sounds they like. Are. Okay. All right. If your staff hours are decreased and hence payroll amount may be less than last year's time frame. Can the rest of the money be used for rent, utilities, and other allowed expenses and still be forgiven? The answer is there's, there's also a two-pronged thought process here. One, if your total payroll has decreased by more than 25% on a pro rata basis underneath greater than 25%, the amount of your loan will not be forgiven the rest of the dollar amount that you receive on the loan needs to be applied again 75 percent towards payroll with the remaining 25 percent towards all of the other permissible expenses so it sounds like they're trying to give obviously incentive to keep them working at um a similar pace that they were before not less than 25 percent so that that can be forgiven. That is 100% correct. Okay. Um, all right. And, and then there was a question. Did you say EDIL through bank or the SBA? I believe that was the SBA, correct? The EIDL, you can go to sba.gov and there's a special section for coronavirus and you can make the application for that product directly with the SBA. There is no intervention as it relates to financial institution. Okay. And then do you have an Excel sheet for the EIDL? The EIDL is alone. There is Excel. no formula, there's no Excel spreadsheet. It's to be able to give you working capital to help your supply chain management, your resources. It's also used to pay payroll. The first $10,000 depending upon how it you, will be forgiven as a forgivable grant. Okay. Um, and that could be extended in as, as easy as three days after application. So beyond that $10,000, the rest of it is not forgivable like the- That's the correct. Okay, so it's just the first 10,000, up to 10,000 um, could be forgiven. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then there's a question, maybe some advice here. What would you do if you applied for your financial institution, but they have not contacted uh, you regarding the application that needs to be submitted? Uh, their online states that you should not call, that a rep will be contacted. I don't know what we can really say there. Um, you know, there's, there's financial institutions that I have seen today and through the weekend that are posting something that just says, hey, put some information in and it'll give you kind of like a ticket number and yeah. we will get back with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, if, if you, if you have multiple banks that you are in dealing with, that you are engaged in business with what I'm advising my clients. And it's my opinion that you should also go to that other institution and see what their process is. It may be less onerous. It may be easier. You may be able to submit the application today. Well, that's, that actually goes right into the next question, which is, can you apply for more than one bank for the PPP in case not approved at the first bank? No, no, it, that you cannot do. Okay, so just check with them and see which one is going to be a better process, um, or yeah, maybe... Which one is easier? Speak to, you know, people that bank at that institution that you may know, fellow business owners within your community. Reach out to your lawyer or your accountant. Find out exactly what he or she feels maybe a better opportunity for you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 
then we have a question. If the PPP is online at SBC, how does it get to my bank institution? I, I'm not really actually sure that's a... I, I'm not understanding the question. Maybe yeah, I'm can... not really understanding that one either. So I'm gonna um, skip that. The PPP is gonna be directly at your bank. So contact your bank. Um, if, and if I- you go, If you go to any financial bank that is part of SBA, that's an SBA approved lender. Mm -hmm. If they are participating, there should be some type of link. I would reach out to your banker immediately tomorrow morning and really try to unearth what is the process? What can we do? You know, do you, are you taking PPP applications? Yes. What's the process? Where is the link? What information is required? So you can assemble all that information before attempting to input all the data. Have it ready because there's significant amount of uploads of payrolls that could be necessary depending upon what financial institution you actually bank through. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think maybe that's just the clarification to that question is that you do not, um, it's, it's not going to be through the SBA at all. The PPP, you would just go directly to your bank for that. That um, is perfect. And then there was a question is the spreadsheet that you're using right now, is that going to be made available? And I believe that that is correct. Be more than happy to make it available, but again, you know, look at this as kind of a guide this is you know this yeah, should not be viewed as concrete should not be gospel it should actually truly be a guide as far as to work from to give you a sense of what the loan could be wonderful thank you um and then there's a question, how does it work with additional owners, um, for example, in a corporation, if they have more than one non-related business? Again, on the application, it will actually state, are you an affiliate? Do you have any other ownership of a, of a certain percentage greater than, let's say, 20 of another organization? If you do, there is a supplement to the paycheck protection program application where you have to list the other entity okay. you know but again the other entity is going to have employees onto itself the main purpose that i believe that they're asking for this is you the business owner how much payroll are you taking from company a and company b because the calculation of the maximum loan amount it cannot be for employees. For instance, if an employee earns greater than a hundred thousand, you have to reduce his or her salary to a hundred thousand and input that into the formula here. So again, I don't know exactly the thought process behind it. I can only surmise is to ensure that a highly compensated individual is not being enumerated from company A and B, and therefore is earning more than an equivalent of $100,000 per year in this formula that is used to get you the maximum loan amount. And I think that is a good point too. With the $100,000 per year, um, some people I think sometimes will misinterpret that for the um, you know, you've got to divide that by 12 and just look at those eight weeks, right? So Correct. So it's $8,333.33, you know, per month. Right. So if you make over a hundred thousand, you're not automatically excluded because they're just looking at the eight week time frame. You are not, that is hundred percent correct. Okay. And so I think that might go to this question that it says, if I have a PLLC with two partners, can I include our distributions more than a hundred thousand each into the wages? If not, should we file the other application next week specifically for partnership since I can't apply for both? Um, Again, so the, I, the PPP is the same type of situation, but partnerships, depending upon what you call as a guaranteed payment to a partner, it's very, very different than a distribution. But as it relates to partnerships, 
the amount of guaranteed payments to that individual partner plus the amount that you pay to your employees is going to be part of the salaries and compensation. So both the amount enumerated to the individual, let's just call it doctors, okay, plus the entire staff would be part and parcel for total wages enumerated. And again, the distributions that are given during that time frame alone. So. If, the dis if the distributions are guaranteed payments, yes. Okay. Because they would be subject to self-employment tax. Okay. Um, uh, all right. We actually have a ton of questions still coming. So I don't know, is there another part that you needed to move on to, or do you want me to keep going on this? I want to be... No, I, I think the I think the back and forth as it relates to the question answer session is actually very important. Okay. Hopefully we can address other people's concerns as well through that. But the main the main concept that I wanted to bring forth is what is the PPP? It is ever flowing. It's something that you should reach out and immediately engage, gather the documentation and make application for. Right, wonderful. So one question going back then again to like the whole uh, idea of rehiring people. Um, somebody said an example on the question number three states is the applicant of an any owner of the applicant of any business or have common management with any other business. I read that the act provides where layoff of reductions occur between um, February 15th to April 26th the loan forgiveness reduction will not recognize those if they are undone prior to 630. Again, you had the full-time equivalent, yes, but during that time period as well, there's going to be a reduction in the overall salaries. So while your equivalency may work, yeah. okay, are you going to restore your full and complete payroll? And again, just like everything is ever flowing okay what i'm trying to really bring forth in in this webinar is what we know today right even the four percent that was always listed before up to four percent and then during last week it was 0.5 percent now finally in the final review of this law it's one percent as far as the loan and any excess so things are changing fluid it's very you know things are changing by the day so to speak so as it relates to bringing people back from what i understand is you have a two-pronged approach the full-time equivalent employees that yes you can restore them great and provided that your salary does not decrease by more than 25 percent because it's still possible to restore your employee base. And even if you do such, the salary threshold will not fall beneath that 25% level. Then you're, then it's beautiful. But if it falls beneath that 25% level, then you will have a pro rata reduction to what could be forgiven. But even if it's not forgiven, even if this dollar amount that we are going to receive is not forgiven you're at a loan of one percent over two years that's phenomenal where else are you going to be able to get a loan product at one percent yes it's a two-year payback period i get it but literally it's utilizing monies just to provide stability within your practice Great points there. Thank you. Um, so we also had a question. Is the forgivable loan taxable? It is not. That is, that is absolutely beautiful. To the extent that the amount is forgivable. That person has read the, the documentation for sure. To the extent that the loan is forgivable, it is not included in your taxable income when you file your 2020 return. Okay, great. Um, and then there was a question about if you could go over the EDIL info required um, on the website for that. Is there just some maybe forms that can show it? 
The documentation for the EIDL loan on SBA.gov, it's wonderful. It really goes through, and the SBA does have the loan application online for the EIDL product, very, very clear and, and concise on their website. So I, I don't find that to be very difficult to navigate through. I don't think most people would find it difficult. It is extremely self, it, it's intuitive and very, it explains itself extremely well. Okay, wonderful. And um, do they need to have an employee to apply for the EIDL? An employee? Mm -hmm. You mean an EIN? Uh, it just says, do you need to have an employee? So does the business need to have an employee yeah. or if I am my own, the answer is no, you can apply for the EIDL without having any employees. Okay. And that might, that might actually answer this question too. It says if I'm a schedule C sole proprietor and not on payroll as staff, how can my income be protected as I'm not on payroll? and net profit is my income that that answer is just there her his or her net profit is his or her income and that's what needs to be justified and substantiated so if you actually wrote off in let's say you wrote off and you had all of these expenses and you really did not have any income then that is going to decrease the amount of your availability of the paycheck protection program. So they would still apply for the paycheck protection program. Depending upon the extent of their employees that they may have had through their schedule C plus their profitability, depending upon how those numbers actually sum, it may prove more beneficial to go for the EIDL product. Okay. And not the PPP. Okay. Um, which even though the whole thing is not forgivable, at least up to 10,000 would be forgivable under EIDL. Correct. Okay. Um, and then I submitted the disaster loan last week, but I did not hear anything. Also not 10,000 deposited in my bank. What should I do? I, I, you know, these are the, the, the questions that I'm hearing on, on a consistent. As basis. you've said, you, nobody has actually seen the money yet, but Perfect. under that one, you, it does say from the time that it's successfully processed, it should be three days, but we don't three, exactly know. It should be three business days. Business days. Right. Okay. So depending upon when it was processed and I would even say, give it four. Um, if not, I would reach out to the SBA and just inquire. Okay, good advice. Um, all right, if you normally give your employees a raise and your calculations show that you would have excess PPP, can you give the raise to the employee to use the excess funds that would turn into a loan? You mean into a forgivable, forgivable type of situation? Look, you know, that's something that I would say that that individual needs to speak to their CPA, their legal counsel, and, and discuss that because that is very, very specific to his or her own individual fact situations um, versus what the intent is of the product, which is we're going to keep the dollar amounts and we're going to stabilize our employees through this paycheck protection program. So that's a that's an individual question that should be addressed to their professional advisors. Okay, thank you. Um, we have somebody else that has a that's an LLC um, for a real estate company that owns apartments with rent losses but no employee. So they don't have any employees. Um, and they're asking which loan is better. If I don't get forgivable loan, am I guaranteed to get a loan uh, with the EIDL? You are, the EIDL, you do have to make application for. And there's some there's, collateral and things if it's over 25. Correct. Yeah. So here, if we do have a building and it could be collateralized, 
you know, you are going to subject yourself as it relates to that. But the EIDL seems to be a more fitting product um, for that individual. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, this person that was asking, I guess this is just an opinion here. Um, if, if these economic problems are likely to go on for longer than two months, should we really put people back on the payroll that are receiving unemployment benefits? You know, that becomes really a personal decision that you need to make. I have a lot of clients in the medical space. I have a lot of doctors, um, dentists, medical groups um, in our practice. And, and, and there's certain portion of the medical community, let's say the dental professionals that even have a moratorium in some states that they're not able to work, yes. but for emergencies. So this is having a great impact and there's different strategies that can be employed um, again, there's, there's no one size fits all. My thought process is that there is going to be stabilization in the paycheck protection program, and we're not able to resume what is the new norm of work hereafter. And it's going to be extended. I could only imagine that there has to be an additional olive branch that would have to be provided to keep stability. But again, that's only my personal view. Who knows there's that and that's where the little nuances okay really come into play about an individual's practice the type of practice how many people the human aspect of it um that really comes into play so it's, it's hard to be able to say what one should do there is no cookie cutter one size fits all approach right right appreciate that um all right, and then there, it looks like there's only two questions left, which puts us right on target for our time. So this is great. Um, and we appreciate all the great advice you've been giving so far. Um, so if they applied on April 3rd for the $10,000 loan, and I'm assuming they're referring to the EDIL there, um, should they withdraw the application? I, I really feel that you, I, one, I don't know how you can withdraw the application. Yeah. Um, so it, it's hard to say, nor do I understand what would be the pros and the cons and what's the dollar amount that the PPP they have employees, right? This individual versus the EIDL program. So it's, it's hard to, to be able to give a definitive answer. Right. Um, okay. Uh, and then what, and then the other question was, do you know the maximum loan amount on an EIDL um, and how you qualify for that? Do they the check your credit score or check your tax returns? I think it's just like a normal loan, right? They are going to check your credit and. Correct. That is, that is a normal process, a normal loan. And to, to what I see is that loan goes up to the, the $2 million mark. It goes up to two million, um, but from what I understand, and you could correct me, Joel, but if you don't qualify for the actual loan, you may still be given that ten thousand dollars as a grant. Um, that that is one hundred percent correct. Yes. So you could still apply for it, even if you don't actually end up qualifying for it. You could be given that um, emergency funds um, as a grant that you won't have to pay back. That is correct. Okay um all right and then uh, sorry my thing was jumping ahead here so if we maintain all of our employees and there's little work to do um they need to do anything do they need to actually be doing anything to stay on payroll or could they in essence just continue to pay them even though there's not really if the office is closed and things like that you know, again, they, they again they can sit home and watch TV and eat bonbons, and that's fine. And that's so, still, as long as you're paying them that payroll, then that would um, come off of that under the payment protection. I think that's the idea behind it: is they want you to maintain payroll, even though they know that work's not happening. Um, that is that is correct. And what does that mean for the owner? Well, the owner still is able to collect his or her salary and pay rent 
pay the utilities, pay the fixed cost, so to speak, of the organization. As you can see, there's no variable cost here. You know, there's no syringes, there's no gauze, there's nothing that is disposable. These are only the fixed costs to maintain the organization with the lights kind of off. Right. Um, and then it looks like we're right getting close to the end here. But um, so the question is, what's the cutoff date for the PPP? And can so? And I think we've already answered this other question. They're asking, can we? Can someone claim expenses before the loan or only expenses after the loan is received? Sound like from you before that it, it's only after your eight week starts after you receive the loan for any expenses at that time, right? Correct. Um, and as far as the cutoff date, uh, do you want to speak to like the limited amount that's out there and any of that? Well, that's the issue. There isn't a limited sum of money that's out there. For instance, Wells Fargo today felt that they already, and they've cut off any applications for the PPP. They felt that they reached what they feel comfortable with as far as $10 billion. Um, they're not accepting any more applications. So if we are banking, at certain institutions, that is the cutoff. So you have a cutoff as it relates to an institution and the overall cutoff is once the SBA expends, let's just call it $350 billion, once that is consumed, again, there is no more funds to support this program unless Congress infuses more dollars. So the sooner the better, if this is something that's going to benefit you, you want to get on it as soon as possible. 100%. The sooner the better. So from my vantage point, you know, the sooner you can make the application, the sooner you can get the information that's necessary to submit the application, the better for you. Okay. And then, um, and then there was a, a question about, they filled out the ED, DIDL, but they did not ask for any debt documentation right now just to answer the questions. Does that sound right? I think they're just looking for clarification that they did it correctly. They're gonna ask for document. I mean, I think if there's a submission number, if there's a tracking number that you received, that's something that you should reach out to SBA just to find out, do they need additional information or what is the time span to receive this? Okay, um, and then, I'm sorry, I know we're going a little bit over here, but a few more questions have come in. Are you good with staying just a little bit longer, Joel? Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry about this in the background here. Hold on one second. Okay, so it says, can you uh, can I apply both as the business and as an independent contractor? My business pays me with a 1099. No. Okay. And that was for the EIDL application. Um, the EIDL, remember, you're going to apply for the business. Okay. Um, uh, and this one, a similar question, I guess, but they're asking, but maybe the answer might be different because they're saying, can you apply for more than one EIDL, one for my business using the tax ID and one for my rentals using my social security number? Again, it's going to be gone through, you know, a due diligence and underwriting process. You know, the SBA is going to require documentation to substantiate and support. You know, so from that vantage point, if you have a rental income or a rental business and you have your other business, if both entities or both types of businesses have the generation of money and they can show that they have the financial wherewithal to continue with a going concern, but for this chasm of time, it's very possible that you will get loans. Okay, great. And I think that answers the next one, which is just if they have um, multiple LLCs, then they could um, apply under multiple separate um, loan applications, it sounds like, rather than just one, because would, you wouldn't want to do just one at that point. 
you can do multiple, but it's going to be where is, is there commonality of ownership? Gotcha. How is that going to look? List all, because remember we're, we're signing and we are also taking an oath, so to speak, that we are making this application in good faith and providing all the cor correct documentation. So if you have constructive ownership between and amongst various entities, are you truly at a loss? Do you truly have a reduction of income for each and every entity? Yeah. Those are the things that are going to be specific to each individual that they really need to be able to reach out, speak with your financial advisor, reach out to your CPA, talk to your legal counsel so you have proper advice going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, and I think the, the questions keep coming. I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them, but um, a lot of them sound similar. Um, so we, again, will be giving you a copy of this recorded presentation. Uh, so you can listen back through and hopefully a lot of those questions will be answered. Um, I will ask one that's a little bit unique here. It says, um, they it's a 10 they have seasonal employees for 10 to 11 months um so i guess contract employees would not include a temp employee employed through a temp agency correct they're asking about that if if they have them through a temp agency there's something called a peo professional employer organization and a PEO is going to provide you employee base. So depending upon the structure, um, the contract with your PEO, they could very well be included. Um, we have a situation right now in my firm where all of their employees are through a PEO and it is permissible to include those individuals in this formula, in this calculation. Okay. Seasonal employees also, there's different formulas to apply to the look back period to figure out what is your maximum loan. So that's something also that people should address with their independent CPAs, legal advisors to be able to fill out the form appropriately. Okay. And then along that same lines, um, somebody else commented that they're a mental health practice with independent contractors. Um, so they could still apply for the PPP, right? They're just asking um you know they work remotely from home with support staff so they're can they can continue to work but they're just wondering if that um if they can still apply for the ppp in that well, scenario definitely, you can definitely apply still for the ppp because if you feel that this is going to have an impact on your business if people are going to lose potentially their jobs not have coverage not be able to pay the co-pays not have insurance to be able to enumerate you, you know, as a mental health counselor, um, that is going to have a severe impact on your income. So you need to protect yourself today by taking advantage of this product. Thank you. Uh, we had lots of uh, compliments to the valuable information that you've shared, Joel. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, again, we will be making this recording available. And if you do have that spreadsheet, we would like to uh, send that out as well. Um, I know there were some links in the, the webinar invitation that give you direct links to some of these core resources, um, the SBA, some, some other great documentation um, that helps you there. So we will be pushing that out and sharing it. And um, again, thank you for your time and for everybody else joining us today. Feel free to contact us if there's additional questions that any of you have. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Joel. Stay self, say, safe and, happy and, and healthy. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hey there, if you want more videos like this, we have a host of webinars scheduled to help you as you navigate through this time of uncertainty during the COVID-19 pandemic. Check out our webinar schedule on our website. You can find this at www.ascomp.com events. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.